welcome. I, my name is Michelle Chatwin, and I'd like to welcome you to the Boreas Symposium. I think we've got an excellent program running today of two pro-con debates. I'd like to introduce my co-chair. Thank Please. you, Michelle. I'm Manuel Lujan from Sabadell, Spain, and it's really a pleasure to co-chair the session with you, Michelle. The session, as you have said, is planned in two blocks of uh, 15 minutes uh, each speaker about uh, two uh, controversial issues in an invasive uh, mechanical ventilation. The first block is dedicated to hybrid modes in non-invasive ventilation. Should be considered as a first-line therapy or not? And with that, I'd like to welcome our first speaker who is joining us virtually. I'd like to introduce Mark Elliott, who is a consultant physician at St. James University Hospital in Leeds and set up the ventilation service there. He's oh I've made a mistake. I do apologize. I've got it the wrong way around. There's always someone that gets it wrong and it and it's me. So I'm gonna stop there and I'm not going to introduce Mark. I'll let Manel do that later, <laughs> and I will introduce <laughs> Professor Stena Stefano Nava, who is a consultant respiratory physician and head of the intensive care and respiratory unit at the San... I always get it wrong, Orsla Hospital in Bologna. So Stefano is going to tell us that um, hybrid modes are not prefer the preferred choice for home mechanical ventilation. So, Stefano, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, to Michelle. You improve every time to say Santorsola. Next time, we will do even better. Uh, thank you also to Manel and to Breas for this kind invitation. So, it's easy, my task, because what I'm going to start with is the European Respiratory Society guidelines where Mark Elliott was uh, one of the member. And you see when we need to take uh, uh, an opinion about uh, uh, fixed mode versus hybrid mode, uh, the task force suggests using fixed pressure support mode as preferred ventilatory mode in patients with COPD on long-term uh, mechanical ventilation. So I'm going to stop to stop here uh, because I think that all the experts, I think, agrees with me uh, in the fact that uh, uh, not fixed mode uh, is the uh, mode of, choose, of, uh, of choice. Well, uh, before going any further, I need to illustrate uh, uh, what do we mean full volume target mode. Well, there are two ways uh, of uh, uh, defining uh, pr uh, volume target mode. Uh, the first one use a preset tidal volume and uh, uh, others like uh, uh, volume assure, average volume assure pressure support devices uh, use preset alveolar ventilation. Uh, in either case, the target is achieved either by monitoring respirator volume with a built-in pneumotachograph and on the other side, uh, using preset alveolar ventilation, uh, automatically also adjusting uh, uh, pressure support within a preset minimum and maximum values to achieve uh, uh, what the clinician think is the ideal tidal volume or ventilation level. Well, uh, the huge difference according to the engineer uh, between fixed mode such as pressure support and hybrid mode is that what we call fixed mode are uh, following the classical logic. While hybrid modes uh, follow what they call fancy logic. Well, uh, FEDSI logic is a quite complex uh, uh, definition. However, I try to make it simple to what I understood about this logic. Well, the classical logic permits a conclusion that are either true or false. For example, uh, is, is the color green or is the color yellow? 
But as you can see uh, in the cartoon, there are also propositions with variable answer. And this depends on how do you see, for example, a color, because green can be defined as this green or the other green, as well as, for example, yellow, blue, or red. Well, this is an interesting assumption uh, for, uh, for different uh, uh, fields of application. However, my question here is, uh, does this assumption work for a ventilatory mode? Well, let's start with what I define targeting uh, tidal volume uh, as, an, as a hybrid mode. Well, here I want to show you uh, a review uh, quite recent, 2019, compare the five studies, randomized control trial, comparing fixed mode with uh, a volume targeting mode. Uh, as, watch, please, the main outcome and the other outcome. Concerning the main outcome, there is, there are, there is discrep discrepancy of results. Some show uh, that the two modes are similar, some others the tidal volume on average is lower and some are that higher. But and concerning the other outcomes like uh, arterial gases, uh, uh, sleep profile, they all state that the two modes are similar. And my question to Mark and to myself is why? that well uh, i found a lot of biases uh, in the studies comparing the two modes uh, none of the randomized trial were double blinded none of the randomized trials really employ uh, polysonography uh, to retitrate uh, uh, the, uh, pre the level of pressure to optimize niv study were generally small uh, comparison in these randomized com uh, control trial were also limited by technical features such as different algorithms used by different ventilators. And last but not least, uh, the randomized control trial and stable hypercapnic patient were either single night crossover of a very short duration between five days and three months. So it is very difficult to find a clinical meaning in this study. Uh, another drawback is that in clinical practice, when you choose a target, uh, a volume target mode, uh, many clinicians choose, for example, a minimal IPAP around 10 centimeter of water. The minimal IPAP is the minimal IPAP allowed to reach that preset tidal volume. Well, long time ago, um, Sami Jaber and Laurent Brochard show in acutely ill patients that if you increase, and please uh, watch first uh, the left-hand side, uh, that space using pressure support, then you can easily increase the flow and therefore the tidal volume with a very little increase in transdiaphragmatic pressure. That means the effort of a patient. On the other side, if you set, as in this case, the maxima, the minimal allowed iPad at six centimeters of water, and uh, the patient is need the, uh, has a need to breathe harder because the dead space is increased and therefore it needs to generate higher tidal volume, the patient is stuck. It's stuck because the uh, ventilator is reducing the level of pressure support since uh, uh, tidal volume has been reached. And therefore, the patient is in dramatically also increasing uh, the, the effort of the diaphragm in order to achieve a greater tidal volume needed when you increase that space. Indeed, uh, as clearly demonstrated by Brigitte Farou, the performance of ventilator with regard to their ability to respond to pathological uh, sit, uh, situation and its resolution varied widely and no ventilator is really adequate to deliver a minimal tidal volume without a big overshoot or even patient dyssynchrony that in some case can be very severe. What is uh, uh, the meaning and what are the clinical results when we move to a slightly different hybrid mode, like 
voice mode targeting alveolar ventilation. Uh, this mode, the most classical one, is called uh, high VAPS and combine pressure support ventilation with a target volume. I aim to reach a set alveolar ventilation by adjusting the level of pressure support within a preset uh, pressure uh, ranges of pressure. The target alveolar ventilation is an estimation of the average tidal volume as a function of ideal body weight. That means uh, anatomical depth space. Well, here is uh, the, um, another table from the same paper that I showed you before, the review uh, of uh, six studies comparing uh, uh, the fixed mode with uh, tidal volume targeting alveolar ventilation. And all the main outcomes, uh, they're all similar. So in my view, there is no need to switch a patient from a fixed mode to a classical mode, um, to a, an hybrid mode, since the main outcomes are exactly uh, similar uh, in all the study considered. Why that? Well, because uh, uh, the physiological or total death space, as you know, is equal to anatomic plus alveolar death space. And uh, the physiology told us that in healthy adult, alveolar death space can be considered negligible. However, especially in patients, in respiratory patients, in patients with, uh, with lung disease, uh, one can observe uh, uh, some uh, alteration in the diffusion membrane of the alveoli, uh, or when there is a ventilation perf perfusion mismatch defect. So the calculation of alveolar hypoventilation based on that formula may be quite misleading. Well, there are other factors that can influence the dead space, respiratory cycle, positioning, sleep, and the conformation of maxilla. Let's move to the last point I want to tackle. In this day, it became very popular what they call uh, the uh, utility of force oscillation to set the expiratory pressure and to avoid flow limitation. Well, this is theoretically an interesting way to ventilate at home of the patient, and the mode is called AVAPS AE, and combine a target volume to an automatic adjustment of expiratory pressure. When uh, uh, obstructive apneic events are detected using an interesting technique uh, described here in Italy, Milan, using a force oscillatory technique that dynamically determines upper airway resistance. And this is very important in, uh, in uh, COPD patients and also other patients, for example, with sleep disturbances. If apneic events are detected, EPAP is increased to obtain airway patterns. And this also be very useful in patients with flow limitation. But how many of these patients are really flow limited? And we know that flow limitation may be uh, uh, due to several reasons. For example, the position of the patient. And we know that, for example, during nighttime, the patient may frequently change the position. So far, we have very small study and short-term study, not more than four of them. And here are the two of the most recent, they're quite promising. However, uh, we cannot conclude anything since, as I said to you before, they were mostly single night study and with very small number of patients, less than 10 usually. Then I need to remind to you that is the EPAP, EPAP level, that means the expiratory pressure level, is set to overcome. Uh, flow limitation, we need always to take into consideration that the lungs uh, uh, are not equal. There are zones, as described here in, uh, in this uh, cartoon, where flow limitation is uh, very important and the other zone of the lung uh, without uh, uh, flow limitation. So setting or varying expiratory pressure. Uh, may be useful in one zone of the, of the lung and sometimes detrimental in another zone of the lungs in the same patient. So I finish 
um, questioning what are the uses of phagi logic. Well, phagi logic is employed everywhere from a washing machine to copy machine, dishwater, and also airspace. Why I finish talking about airspace? I know that patients are not airplanes and doctors are not pilots. However, uh, you are in France, and for sure all the people, the French people, sadly remember what happened on June 1st, 2009, flight Air France 447, crash into the Atlantic. The flight was from uh, Sao Paulo de Brazil uh, to uh, Paris, killing all the 220 people on board. Why well, I'm saying that? Because the just majority of time, the computer on board that I can uh, uh, translate for the patient, that the computer is the ventilator, operates on what is known as normal law. The fight control computer under normal law, for example, will not allow an aircraft to start. However, when the computer on board, as the pneumotac, for example, lots is airspeed data as it happened in this flight. For example, if a computer that we got on the ventilator miss a reliable uh, measure of tidal volume, it disconnect on the airplane, the autopilot, and switch from normal low to alternative low. Regime with far fewer restrictions on what the pilot can do. In other words, if the patient, for example, increase that space, as I show you, the ventilator may give up if we, if we did not have a reliable measure of tidal volume. So when trouble suddenly spring up, and the computer decides that it can no longer cope on a dark night, perhaps in turbulence, from from lands, the human might themselves think with a very incomplete notion of what is going on. Then we wonder what instruments are reliable and which can be trusted. What's the most pressing threat? What is going on? So sending the patient home with an hybrid mode, thinking that everything is going to be fine just because a computer and the ventilator are going to take over to all the problem uh, can be very dangerous for the patient and also for the clinician. And in this day, I cannot finish as I used to do in this day hoping really that uh, we need to give peace a chance. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, it's up to you now. At, at least I know that you smile because I see one of my dog running on the couch, right? Thank you, very, thank you very much, Stefano, for your presentation and for your illustrative uh, comparison. Uh, as Professor Nava presented, uh, Professor Elliot, okay, uh, I, I would like to add something. Uh, Professor Mark Elliot is consultant uh, physician at St. James University Hospital in Leeds. He's responsible of, uh, for developing the sleep and ventilation service at the same hospital. Uh, has been a British, Society, a British Thoracic Society president and he has a vast amount of public and NIV, and in addition, is one of the co-authors of the task force that Professor Nava was referring to. Professor Elliot, it's your uh, turn to defending the pro that uh, should the NIV uh, hybrid modes be as a first-line therapy. Thank you. Thank you. Let's just get that on there. Thank you very much, uh, Manuel and uh, Michelle, and thank you very much to Brias for asking me to be involved in this symposium and um, for putting me up against such a formidable opponent as Stefano. I was pleased to see that halfway through his, do his talk, one of his dogs lost interest and walked out. Um, I hope members of the audience weren't doing the same. Um, when we had a teleconference a few weeks ago to discuss this, and Stefano suggested that it might be nice if we could try and present from the same slides. Um, so he sent me through his slides. I usually work on the basis of one slide per minute of talk, and I've got 15 minutes. He sent me through 60 slides. I'm glad to say that he subsequently reduced them down. Um, and not unsurprisingly, he started with this. Um, now, you may be a little bit surprised in a pro-con debate that 
I am actually going to say that I agree with almost everything Stefano said. Um, and therefore, I'm not going to go through every single slide and talk to it. My problem is with what he didn't say. And so if we start with this, um, first of all, the task force, he didn't highlight the fact that this was a conditional recommendation with very low certainty of evidence. And indeed, he went on to, to point out all the limitations of the various studies that were involved. And so I'm not going to go over those again. But I would say that, that the sort of methodology that is used in these task forces of using the grade methodology is not really terribly good for our field. Because generally speaking, straight away, we're going to be faced with it being a low certainty of evidence because there is always the problem of blinding, which is a major factor in deciding that. Now, he showed us these studies, um, and I'm just going to flick through them very quickly. And you, you can see that in the majority of cases, things were similar. And indeed, this is not entirely surprising because the aim of these studies was to prove equivalence rather than to show superiority. Um, he's already mentioned the various bias bi biases. Um, I think the other thing is, which is right. So for instance, if we take this slide here, we make the assumption that the human being, the human titration is the gold standard. Um, just became it because it came first doesn't necessarily mean that it is right. And so it is possible that in the situations where we see a different result, that the hybrid mode is actually getting it right and the quote gold standard is actually wrong. I think the real problem for me with all of these studies is that they're performed in expert centers. Um, they're enthusiasts. Um, they've usually got more resource because they're research attractive. And the vast majority of non-invasive ventilation is taking place in a rather different reality. And that's exemplified by this study, which is in a, a, an audit of acute non-invasive ventilation and exacerbations of COPD. Um, and this followed on from uh, NIV becoming well established as a treatment because of all the randomized controls showing very significant benefit. And I'm not going to go through this in great detail, but I do just want to point this out to you. This is patients who are acidotic on admission. So the group of patients who we would generally feel should benefit from NIV. And what you can see here is that the patients who received NIV had a significantly worse outcome than those who did not. So NIV in the real world using standard machines is actually causing more harm than it is good. Remember that in the studies, mortality was approximately halved, whereas here it is being doubled. And this has been shown in other audits. Furthermore, patients who were most likely to benefit were not receiving it. So nearly one third of the patients for whom there was the best evidence base for NIV did not receive it, 66% um, compared to 34%. And the authors concluded that this raised uh, concerns that challenged the respiratory community. And I'm pleased to say that things are significantly better. But what is borne out in the lab is not always what we see in everyday clinical practice. Now, this is a study of, that has utilized a hybrid mode in everyday clinical practice. It's, a, it's not a randomized controlled trial, so immediately one can criticize it um, in terms of evidence-based medicine. But what the authors showed was that using um, hybrid modes and using telemonitoring, that in the uh, a bit on the left, that you can achieve results in COPD patients very similar to those that were achieved in the HOT-HMV trial. They used this um, technology in this way because this was done in Glasgow um, and they have quite a lot of patients who come from remote islands from the west coast of Scotland and it's not easy to bring them backwards and forwards to hospital. So in the real world, a hybrid mode together with telemonitoring can achieve similar results to those seen in randomized controlled trials. Stefano mentioned these various issues that can affect dead space. And of course, there are lots of other things that can be changed um, during, during sleep. Um, for instance, uh, during different phases of sleep, respiratory drive changes, um, position changes. So upper airway obstruction may come into play in some positions and not others, et cetera, et cetera. And it's also true that intercurrent illness can affect things. So patients, even with, with mild respiratory infections, things can change significantly. 
And both Stefan and, uh, and I will remember the times in the early days of research in the, the, this area where trials had such small numbers that you couldn't really do um, statistics and therefore things were always divided into responders and non-responders. And I think generally speaking, when we look at that, that we think that any outlier is some sort of statistical quirk. Whereas the reality is that it might be a real phenomenon, that it might be that some patients respond very differently to an intervention than others. And though the average may not show any benefit, that there is a subgroup who are actually responders who do benefit. And of course, we're increasingly recognizing this. And this is a couple of trials. This is about the use of mepolizumab in patients with asthma. And this first study just gave it to a non-selected population of patients. And you can see here that whatever dose of mepolizumab was used, there was no statistically different um, outcome compared with placebo. If, however, you tailored the therapy to a particular subgroup of patients who in other studies have been shown to benefit, in other words, they were the outliers or the statistical quirk, these were patients with type 2 inflammation, eosinophilia, two, uh, more than two exacerbations per year, and on high doses of inhaled corticosteroids, you suddenly see that actually now there is a very significant advantage to this group of patients receiving mepolizumab compared with the control group. So one size does not fit all. That if you just give this to an average patient, you see no benefit. If you give it to a selected patient, you see a very significant benefit. And the patients in all the trials that Stefano talked about were just not selected as being those who might benefit from a hybrid mode. And just to illustrate this in a way that I find easier to understand, this was a study from um, John Stadling and Rob Davis and others in Oxford comparing automatic CPAP machine with um, the standard way of manual titration of CPAP um, for patients with obstructive sleep apnea. It was like the other trials that we've discussed, an equivalence trial, and they showed absolutely no difference between the two approaches. And we therefore, in our practice in Leeds, moved very much towards automatic titration for everyone. And what we see in everyday clinical practice, that in some patients, the automatic machine behaves exactly like a fixed pressure machine. The pressure ramps up to, say, eight centimeters of water, and then over the course of the night, there is almost no change. However, in other patients, you see a much more variable pattern, and presumably this relates to patients who are changing their posture more during sleep, um, or who have different physiology during REM versus non-REM with more marked upper airways, obstruction, or whatever. So if you give it to everybody, you will not see overall a benefit, but if you give it to the group who might be expected to benefit from a machine that can adjust the pressure according to the patient's needs, that suddenly you see actually there's a very significant advantage. And all the other studies that have looked at this have just given it to everybody without particularly trying to focus on those who might be most likely to benefit. Now, Stefano told us about this study um, and the problems with it. Um, this is actually from the abstract and from the results. And what you can see here is that the ventilators were able to maintain a minimal tidal volume during an increase in airway resistance and a decrease in lung compliance. But where they struggled was when there were problems with non-intentional leak. And that's when the, the, there were large variations in tidal volume and patient ventilator dyssynchrony. And I would suggest that this is not a problem particularly just for a hybrid machine, but leak is a big problem when we're um, using just a, a standard um, old-fashioned old sort of machine. Now, not surprisingly, he told us about this one episode. Um, this is taken from uh, an American law firm's uh, website, which might explain the, the second part of what's said here, but basically makes the point that the vast majority of accidents can be traced back to human error. I went and looked into this at a little more detail and went to the Federal Aviation Administration, um, a, a study that they did about accidents in the US. And what they show here in figure one is a big difference between air carriers, which are big commercial airlines, and then commuter or air taxis, which are much smaller airlines. And I would suggest that one of the major differences between these two is the likelihood of the commercial airlines having very sophisticated um, Sys automatic systems, which do much of the flying for you, whereas the smaller planes will not have this and are therefore much more prone to human error, to pilot error. 
When we look at the sorts of errors that occur, this might ring some bells with this slide I presented earlier about the audit from the UK. Skill-based errors. So in other words, in what we're talking about now, um, an inability to uh, implement the therapy correctly. So non-invasive ventilation being inappropriately applied to patients resulting in a worse rather than a better outcome. Decision errors. Again, this was what we saw in that B in BTS RCP audit, the wrong patients being selected. Violations is people simply not obeying the rules. And of course, that's a fact of human nature. So I would suggest that the machine will always follow the rules better than the average human. And indeed, I would suggest that it's probably true that better than all humans. Yes, machines can make mistakes, but so can people. The manufacturer, or, in, or indeed these days, the machine with artificial intelligence and machine learning can learn from that mistake so that it never happens again. Whereas personal experience is that people tend to make the same mistakes over and over again. And that even if the same person learns from their mistake, somebody else will make that mistake at some stage in the future. And that's why education is so important in, in the provision of acute and chronic non-invasive ventilation services. At the patient level, there is enormous inter- and intra-person variability. So by inter-person, I mean that the patient who um, has the pressure of CPAP that is exactly the same overnight with obstructive sleep apnea versus the one who there is variability. Um, and intra-person, I'm talking about the same person who at one stage is fine, but the next, it, things are very different if they get an upper respiratory tract infection, if they drink alcohol, etc. And one size does not fit all. And even if it does, it no, does not do so all the time because physiology and path pathophysiology are not constant. I think that all machines should be smart. The functionality may not be used. Um, that may be a choice of the operator. And I think it's also noteworthy that Stefano pointed out that it is possible to use a smart machine and to set it up so that it doesn't really function as a smart machine. Um, or one can choose to switch it off. Um, so as we saw in that study from Glasgow, that you may would not need it for some of your local patients and you just choose to use it for those coming from um, longer, uh, further afield, etc. All it is is a software fix, so there's no additional cost. I do accept that for the manufacturers there would have been an R&D cost, but actually once that's all paid off, it doesn't cost any more. So it's a functionality you might as well have. I accept that there will be problems, and all I would say is to the manufacturers, fix them, change the algorithm. Thanks very much for your attention. Both for some excellent presentations. Are there any questions from the audience, or is there either person that may have resulted in their argument changing your practice. I, I certainly think that you both have made some excellent points. And I have seen clinically, I think I was very adverse to using automated systems, but can see the role in centers that are far less experienced, being able to target a ideal body weight and then let the machine take over. I wonder whether either of you have some comments about that sort of philosophy and then how much you would go back in to try and correct things that the machine maybe didn't pick up. So it's, it's a little bit like it's not fully automated because you're going back in examining the data and then correcting things if needed. I mean, I completely agree with that, Michelle, that, that in practice, what we do is uh, the, the machine, the hybrid machines are more expensive. So our default is to use the standard ordinary machine. But when things are not going well, um, and if one can't sort out the problem, sometimes, you know, it's, it's obvious you just it's easy to sort out the issue. But when it's not, it's another thing to try. Um, 
because it may be that actually one is dealing with a patient where things are changing a lot more. Um, one hasn't identified this, uh, it's intermittent or whatever, and we've certainly had patients who things improve once you switch them to a hybrid machine. Um, and I think that there are others. I, w w when we to go back to the CPAP thing, when we first started doing the auto titrating, what we used to do was we did a, a, a titration using a smart machine, and then we took a pressure from the machine and gave them a fixed pressure machine because it was cheaper. And what we found was that some people said, um, give me back my old machine. In other words, the variable smart pressure smart machine, it was much better. The others said, we like this new pressure, they, they, this new machine. Um, they preferred the fact that it wasn't changing. So again, it, the individual is very important in this. If I may add something, uh, first of all, I want to congratulate with Mark because he moved to Bologna University. I did not know that you just moved to Italy because you show half of your life from Bologna University. So you should have told me that you were appointed as a professor in our They university. were your slides, Stefano. Oh, okay. Congrats. No, Thank uh, you. I think there is also a quite huge psychological problem behind the use of hybrid mode. First of all, uh, people, they think that sending a patient at home with an hybrid mode is going to solve everything. And therefore, they, for example, they don't call back uh, regularly the patient in the hospital to check, to download the data, for example, if you don't have a telemedicine system or something like that. So this is the first point. Uh, and the second point, is that setting up a uh, not fixed mode means a sort of uh, uh, reasoning, I would say. Uh, we are just stuck with a lot of protocols in our practice. And I see that in a young fellow. They try to apply protocols without even thinking that they have a patient in front of them. They're more interested in numbers and protocol rather than the patient. So uh, I, my fear is that if you automatize everything, you're going to lose uh, uh, what is the beauty of our uh, profession, that is also try to better understand what the patient is doing and what the machine is doing. I mean, it is clear that we play a game here, pro and contra, because I think that what Michelle said makes really sense, as is a sort of hybrid, hybrid between what you said and I said. But my, my big concern is that uh, using this mode may really blunt a little bit uh, the reasoning, especially of a young fellow. I, I completely agree with you, Stefano, and indeed that's one of the things that I chose not to say. Um, that, that, that the concern about, if you, if you go back to the analogy of the, the pilot, that if the pilot never has to fly the plane, when there is a problem, they can't do it. Um, and I think it's a real challenge that as things become increasingly machine driven, that people stop, and protocol driven, that people stop thinking about what to do when it's not working anymore. Um, and I share your concerns. It's worried me a bit about some of the protocols where the response when the patient doesn't quite fit the protocol, as happens not infrequently, that people don't know what to do. Audience, if you could say who you are, because I know that Stefano and Mark okay. can't see you. Thank you very much. It was very, uh, very nice to hear that. I am Jesus Gonzalez from Paris. I have a question for you because in my head the, the answer is not very clear. In the future, if you think at the perfect ventilator that will fix uh, the problems, the algorithm and uh, good, make a good uh, automatic ventilator, do you think it will be for all the people and not the experts? It means, for example, for, with a car f as a Tesla, a Tesla car, or do you think that these automatic modes will be always for experts like the airplanes, for example, because it's, it's skipped by your airplanes. It's not clear in my head. I would like that it would be the first answer, but I don't know exactly. What is your opinion for that? Shall I answer? I mean, 
I, I think that's that's kind of a variation in what we've just been saying about the concerns about what you do when things don't go right. And if you just start making this all, um, everybody does it. There, there is a danger that you lose when things aren't going right, that nobody recognises it, etc. And I think that uh, the reality is is that for a lot of the patients receiving NIV, this is part of a, a multidisciplinary problem, and it's not just about the machine. It's not just about providing the ventilator. There are all sorts of other issues that need to be addressed. So I think that there are still going to be places for specialist centres. I guess, however, a little bit like sleep apnea, that I personally believe that we're getting not far off the point where a lot of patients with standard straightforward sleep apnea could, could be managed in primary care. Does that mean they all can be? No, it doesn't. There's, there are some who are more complicated um, for whatever reason with multimorbidities, et cetera, and that there will still need to be a, a specialist centre. So I think that a little bit like what we've just been saying of a hybrid model for how you provide the ventilation, that's going to be true to, to where it's provided in a sort of hub and spoke but maybe with a little bit more being provided out in the spoke than in the hub. That would be my view. Yeah, I, I mean, Mark, I, I have to say that finally I agree totally with what you said. And I think you use a very nice word at one point in time, you said education. I think education is something that uh, we need to consider every time as a clinician when we set uh, a ventilator and the, and the patient for uh, home care. Uh, education means that uh, hybrid mode can help you. Uh, uh, Tesla probably is a very good machine, but the education means that you need uh, to know how to drive a car anyhow uh, for, for every instances, because uh, uh, as, as we said, for airplane more or less. So. Uh, I think that hybrid mode may be, at the end of the day, uh, less time consuming, probably, uh, if we put together maybe also a remote mode of monitoring the patient, for example, uh, the combination of uh, uh, cloud or telemedicine together with hybrid mode, but still, still, uh, as I said before, the main issue here, uh, we need to educate people because this is a complex issue that cannot be solved with a Tesla machine only, I think. And, and I think we, we never want to get to the point where the patient comes once, just gets given a box and told to go away, read the instructions and never come back again. That is absolutely because everything will be fine because we know that's not the way it will be. Yeah, it's like, it's like when you want to take a picture with the iPhone. But they do nice picture. You don't need to play anything. But if you want to have the best picture, you need to have a manual camera, even if you are a very good photographer. And uh, I think we need to provide the best care for our patient. So a, a balance between, I think at the end of the day, I think Mark, we are, sa we are saying uh, the conclusion is similar between what you said and I said. But if you want an average standard, so hybrid mode, with few exceptions, can be a danger, it's good. But we want to provide probably uh, the best treatment to our patients. So a combination, as I said, of the two, like of a manual setting and of a hybrid mode may be welcome in future. Only see iPhones taking pictures in the room, but anyway, <laughs> thank you for your answer. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We have uh, time for two questions. Uh, we have one question from the uh, online audience, uh, Ines Belchio. I start NIV, not CPAP, at home with automatic mode to guide me, but end up changing to BiPAP most of the times because I'm not able to control CO2 or oxygenation as well with the auto modes. Do you have this experience? Uh, summarizing, do you have experience in uh, hybrid modes as a titration um, uh, approach? Simple, not not as a titration approach. No, not in the, not in the same way as with CPAP, where absolutely because with that it's pretty easy. You just read off a pressure from the the printout and decide it. Um, I suppose what I would say is that in Glasgow, where the, the, that study came from, that 
that was the approach that they used and they did control CO2. Now, I suppose the question always would be is could, you, could they have done it better if they'd done it manually? And I, do, I can't answer that, but I suppose that um, in terms of the outcome that's important to patients, the mortality outcome is probably more important than what the, the CO2 was. And they showed an equivalent outcome to what was seen in the hot HMV trial. So I suspect that they did control things adequately. Um, it, it does depend a little bit on the algorithm that's used. And again, to come back to the smart CPAP machines, which is where this sort of kind of grew out of, that different manufacturers use different ways of deciding what is the optimal pressure. And similarly, the various, all hybrid modes are not the same, that they have different algorithms that they target at different endpoints, and that may be a factor. But we have certainly seen people who have not been controlled on a conventional mode who have managed, have been managed, things have improved when they've been switched to a hybrid mode. There have also been those in whom it hasn't changed anything. Thank you. We've got um, Claudio in the audience. Thank you very much for this very nice controversy. It's Claudio Rabeck from Dijon. <clears throat> a couple of years ago, which is used, we performed a little survey uh, amongst the pulmonologists in France about the use of those devices. And uh, our surprise was that most of people that use this machine are non-expert ones. So, which is your clinical practice? Which is the place in your clinical expert practice for this automatic devices. I reply briefly, Claudio, hi. Um, to be honest, all the attendees, I would say the large majority of the attendees, they never use the hybrid mode, the fellow they do. Probably because there is a different mentality, you know, they're more used to play with uh, uh, the devices, the uh, uh, mobile phone or whatever, uh, but the attitude of the old, uh, uh, I mean, we live, I mean, I work in a so-called relatively expert uh, uh, hospital, so this may be a bias. Uh, I assume that the fellow are not as expert as the uh, attendees, at least uh, when they start uh, uh, the fellowship. So I probably uh, agree to the fact that less experts are tends to use the automatic uh, uh, setting rather than uh, the, I would say, uh, the personal setting. Uh, however, I mean, I cannot comment much since this is my only clinical experience. Attendees, we don't use much uh, hybrid mode. Thank you. Uh, before uh, finishing uh, this part, uh, we, would uh, we would like to know the opinion from the audience. Please raise your hand, uh, people who considered hybrid modes as a first line therapy in your clinical practice. One. Okay, uh, let's see. Please raise your hand uh, who considered conventional modes as a first line therapy. The, the majority. Okay. <laughs> Hands up if anyone will change their practice based on today. Oh, yep, we have some. Thank you very much, Mark and Stefano. That's amazing. You've summarized two viewpoints, and I think that we always end up really in reality coming together. I think you can have your choice, and somehow we'll, we'll meet in the middle to get an answer. I'm not sure if you're staying on, um, but if you do and you have any questions, please shout out, because we might not be able to see that you have a question and I don't want, or a contribution to the next session, so I don't want to miss that. Thank you, I only have to say one thing. <laughs> I take a lot of money to the audience to raise their hands. And uh, you know, British are cheaper than the Italians, so you didn't want to pay as I did. Okay, thank you very much. And we move to...